and um, and I'm very glad to have you with us today. We're going to be talking about the NV series of FM transmitters, which go from three and a half kilowatts up through 44 kilowatts. We've got a lot of information for you today. New information. We're going to take you on a walk through the inside of the transmitter. We're going to go through a walk through of the AUI, the control system of the of the NV series. We're going to talk about the NV series as it's used in digital modes, in single frequency networks, and an M plus one. And most importantly, we're going to take your questions. So you'll see on the screen here that you can take a look at the webinar viewer that you're using right now, and, and you can add uh, put a question in there, and we'll do our darndest to answer it. Maybe by email later on, but we'll do our darndest to answer it. So let's get started. Nautel, we're here on uh, Hackett's Cove in, in Nova Scotia, Canada at the moment. It's a lovely, beautiful day outside, blue sky. A little bit of snow on the ground, but it's blue sky nevertheless. Uh, Nautel is in business 42 years, uh, 42 years last week, I believe. And, um, and our, we have factories in both Nova Scotia and in Bangor, Maine, in the United States. And our very first transmitters uh, started in 1972. One interesting fact about Nautel you may not know, Nautel has never made a tube-type transmitter, always been at the forefront of, of solid state. Our major product families include the NX series of medium wave transmitters that go from the 25 kilowatt level all the way up to the 2 megawatt level, the VS series of, of FM transmitters, low power FM transmitters at the 300, 1 kilowatt, and 2.5 and kilowatt levels, and our subject of today's webinar, the NV series, which goes from 3.5 kilowatts to 88 kilowatts. Each of these product lines also includes the advanced user interface, the AUI control system, and uh, the ability to view these systems at a distance with great amounts of test equipment and, and uh, diagnostic tools at your beck and call with nothing but a web browser on your end. So let's talk a little bit about the MV series. It was originally introduced in 2008, launched at the NAB in the MV40. It was de described by Radio Magazine in their 2008 pick hit as, quote, the first high-power solid-state FM transmitter with tube-comparable affordability. The full NV series was launched the following NAB in 2009. Again, we got a pick hit, and that means everything from 3.5 kilowatts up to 44 kilowatts. To date, as of today, I just went over and checked it, we've sold 614 of the NV series transmitters, and uh, that makes... Uh, that has gone a long way to make this product line the most successful FM product introduction ever, and it's gone a long way to propel Nautel to the position of highest selling uh, radio transmitter manufacturer in the present day. The Nautel NV series innovations include the revolutionary approach to the user interface and the exciter, which we'll talk a lot more about, the advanced instrumentation and control, which is included in the NV series, high power with no tuning, no tubes, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, hot swappability in the redundant architecture, incredible redundancy built into the NV series, 100% remote access, everything that you can see and monitor from the front of the transmitter, you can see and monitor from across the globe via a web browser. And incredibly small footprints, uh, very small transmitters for their power level. So let's go through the top ten reasons why the VS series and solid state is preferable than a tube. Number ten, tube replacement cost. Tubes cost roughly four to six thousand dollars every two to three years. That's twenty to forty thousand dollars over fifteen years. Routine maintenance. In a tube, there's, it is required to go back and adjust it, tune it on a regular basis to maintain peak performance. Not true in a solid state transmitter. In fact, there's nothing to adjust. Monitoring and control. In the Nautel, we have the advanced user interface, which can save time and trips to the transmitter site. Safety and high voltages. Um, I've worked on tube type transmitters. You know, you could have over 10,000 volts or more. First station I worked for in, this, in, a, in, a, in a radio station in Colorado, I replaced a fellow who'd, who'd done some wrong things and managed to get himself severely shocked. He didn't die, fortunately, but it was, it was a, a wake-up call for me, nonetheless. Solid-state transmitters operated only a few hundred volts. 
more redundancy, less downtime. A tube is a single point of failure. If, you're, if your tube fails, if you lose the filament or you have a grid short or, or something like that, you're off the air. And in the NV series, there's incredible redundancy and soft module failure. You may lose a few watts, but you're not going to go off the air. The footprint, the size of these transmitters is very small. The NV40 footprint is equal to or less than many tube drive transmitters. And unlike tubes, stepping down in power means an even smaller footprint as well as lower cost. Performance variability. In a tube type transmitter, the transmitter performance varies over the life of the tube. Yes, okay, you can raise the screen voltage to get the transmitter gain of that tube back up, but the parameters of that tube are changing. In the NV series, you have consistent solid state performance. There's a wider tolerance for input voltage. In a tube type transmitter, it requires tight voltage regulation to sustain extended tube life, particularly in the filaments. And in the NV series, the voltages from 180 to 264 on the AC input feed, it makes no difference at all in the performance of the transmitter, what voltage over that very wide range on the AC input side. Turnaround loss, huge issue. A tube type transmitter only provides 6 or 7 dB typical turnaround loss versus the 20 dB or better, which you can get from an NV series in a solid state transmitter. This is huge when you're at a combined transmitter site because you're not creating the intermodulational products that you'd have to use, expensive cavity filters and things like that to get rid of. And the number one reason why tubes uh, just don't hack it anymore relative to solid state is long-term support. The long-term availability of tubes uh, versus Nautel's never continued support. In the history, in the 42-year-old history of Nautel, we have never discontinued the support of one of our transmitters. Uh, tube engineering talent as well. The number of people that know how to work on tubes. They're getting older. They're getting grayer like me. And uh, there's just few of us around who remember uh, how to work on tubes. So here's a, a graphical representation of the NV series and how it stacks up relative to size uh, of, of competing products um, in the marketplace today. You can see the NV series is much smaller. When we designed the NV series, we had the following engineering design goals. Increased redundancy, HD radio performance, integral test equipment, a smaller footprint, and the advanced user interface. And, and basically the rest of this webinar, we're going to talk about how we how we did that and, and how we uh, how we work how that worked out. Here's the redundancy perspective, and I know it's a little tough to see here, but you can see the redundant power supplies over here on the left. Every kind of supply from the main fan supply, the standby fan supply, the the uh, AUI uh, SB single board computer supplies, the low voltage power supplies, the IPA supplies, all of that stuff is redundant and automatic switching. Um, there's the opportunity for an, a, a separate redundant exciter if you so choose. The modules, of course, are all in parallel. So if you lose a power amplifier, you lose a very, very small amount of power. In terms of standard redundancy, the RF modules are, of course, in parallel. The power supplies for those modules are in parallel. Integrated PAs are built into the power amplifiers. Let me repeat repeat that again. In most transmitter designs, you've got an IPA and that then fans out and drives all the PAs. That's not the way it is in the NV series. In the NV series, we put an IPA in each and every single PA module. So no one IPA failing takes you off the air. Main standby IPA power supplies, main standby low voltage supplies, main standby fan supply, backup transmitter control, parallel colon fans, parallel RF combiners and filters, and an optional main standby exciter. So this is the most redundant FM transmitter we've ever created. Here's the FM uh, two and a half kilowatt RF module design. This is what's in a single module. You have eight PAs in parallel in a single module plus one IPA, and those are all the same. I'll show you that in the photograph. So the RF drive comes in here, goes through the IPA, gets split out, goes through the eight PAs is recombined and, and goes to the output. And, and we monitor all the different points, the forward power of the RF drive, the forward power going into the splitter, the power going into the reject load on the combiner, and the forward and reflected power. And this is on each and every PA module. Let's look at a PA module. There was one sitting on the, uh, on the bench back there, took a photograph just to let you see what's inside. You can see here 
the eight individual PA supplies. These are all MOSFET type supplies. They can all be removed rather quickly with just a number of, uh, I think it's four or six screws and a couple of uh, quick solder joints that bridge across here and there. And, uh, and so you can replace these. And you'll see here that the IPA, which is over here, is exactly the same module as the PA supply. So if you need a spare, you can keep one spare and it'll work in either the, the spot of a PA or an IPA. This is from the, the, a little bit further back, and you can see the cooling. Now, what, the reason I included this in here, it's very interesting, um, and it was just pointed out to me recently how important this is. The, the fans aren't actually blowing air over the top of the PAs. In fact, the, the, the heat sinks that those PA transistors are affixed to um, the fans are actually blowing air through the heat sinks and out the other side of the, the top side of the, of the module. So this area here where the components are mounted actually stays very clean. It's the underside where the, the heat sink is where all the air is being uh, shot through. And notice also that each of these fans has three wires on each connector. The reason for that is that the yellow wire there is a tachometer. And so the RPMs of every single fan is monitored. Also notice that there's six fans on each module. Yeah, that's a lot of fans. But if I lose a few fans, I'm still operating at full operating power. It again goes to that point of redundancy. Here's the controller board. This is where all the control occurs in the, in the transmitter. It's not in the single board computer. The single board computer, which is mounted on the door, is only for the purpose of the AUI, the front panel screen. You could actually take a really big pair of cutting pliers and cut that cable and shut down that front door completely and your transmitter will continue to work. You actually have backup remote control with these switches and the status lights and the other status lights over here give you complete control of the transmitter. And here's how we accomplish remote control. I want to be talk about this kind of remote control. I'm talking about parallel remote control. So if you want to use parallel control, you have all of the normal types of capabilities you've had in older types of transmitters with buttons and, 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 and lights and things like that, and you can connect into them here. Then these are all programmable within the system as to their effect. The advantage of this is this is in addition to the AUI, which of course gives you all the same remote control capability and monitoring capability that you have from the front of the transmitter. So this is the front door. This shows you where the single board computer is. It's actually behind here. Note that there's no hard drive in there as well. Um, that's just a, a, a memory, uh, a RAM type of hard drive, a solid state memory hard drive, and a touch screen, 17 inch LCD screen, which we'll see what that looks like. In another slide. Another thing that's new and improved on this transmitter is we've got some additional cooling here on the front panel. We had some customers with very warm rooms that were seeing some heat build up behind the door, and there are new fans in the design which are down here, and they blow air up through past the single board computer and the screen, as well as the front of the modules uh, behind the door. So this is an improvement on the existing customers for the NV have been provided this upgrade kit to add that same type of cooling to their units. This is the lower front view. This shows where the modules are. And you'll also see the, the power supplies unplugged here. Now this has got a little shipping um, shield in place to keep the power supplies in place. And you'll also see over here that this transmitter, which is a 20 kilowatt, has the uh, uh, NVE exciter installed here. You might wonder why there's no fancy screens and buttons and switches on the front of the exciter, and that's because everything in the exciter is controlled through the advanced user interface, the AUI, and we'll show you that here in a little bit. There's also a spot here for a redundant exciter. If you so choose, you can plug one in there, and all of the cabling and switching for that redundant exciter is provided in the transmitter. This is the power supply section without the shield in front, the shipping shield in front. And you can see that each of these power supplies are hot pluggable and removable. And you can tell the status of them, not only from the AUI, but also just looking at the front of the power supplies. This is the lower rear view. One of the things I wanted to show you about this is these yellow lights here in the back. 
Those indicate the presence of AC power in the box. This is all about safety. So when you, regardless of whether the transmitter is on or off, if there's AC power in the box, you're going to see it right when you're getting into the transmitter by those three lights in the rear lower part of the transmitter. And that's a, I think it's a big feature of the transmitter from a safety standpoint. This is looking at the top of the transmitter. This is where you hook up your AC connector, you take that panel off for shipping purposes, and you've got the EIA flange there. You can also say they've removed a little bit of a panel over here. That's where you get at in the 20 and the 40 and the 30 kilowatt transmitters and even the 15. This is where you get at the AC mains. This is where you put the AC mains into the transmitter. There's a better view of that. You can see the, the great grounding strip available here as well as the the uh, AC power feed. I should mention, backing up here a little bit, this is showing how to connect up the transmitter for either single phase or three phase. It is possible to reconfigure this transmitter in the field from single phase to three phase or vice versa. So that's a kind of a flexibility a lot of our competitors don't have in their transmitters. Let's talk about wiring the exciter. When you talk about inter integrating the, uh, the audio wiring into the transmitter, you'll be connecting into the exciter here. And this is looking back in the, from the back of the transmitter. So your audio cables come down, whether they're composite or AES-EBU or, or left and right analog or what have you, and they connect to the back of the exciters here. This is the new NV series exciter. It's just been released and, and is now in production. The difference between this exciter and the previous NVE exciter is primarily that we've got some more powerful chips on here which allow us to support HD power boost within this exciter. So if you've purchased the HD power boost feature, or even if you haven't and you're getting a new NV transmitter, it's likely you're going to have this new NVE exciter in there. And that means that at some future point, if you purchase the HD Power Boost, we can enable that feature for you, and uh, that will give you some very you know, significant benefits that I'll explain further. Looking uh, at, the, at the NVE Exciter, there's a power supply, actually several of them. This is the output stage. Most of the transmitters use a 50-watt Exciter. Some of the higher power ones use a 300-watt Exciter. But the Exciter board here that has all of the audio inputs and outputs as well as the adaptive pre-correction, and if you've ordered it, HD Power Boost is all located on this single card here. This is the back panel of the new MB Series Exciter. So you can see here, there's an RF power output over here. There's an RF monitor output over here. The RF sample that facilitates the adaptive pre-correction functionality within the MB Series is right there. Um, you've got all of your audio connections, your RDS connections, and bear in mind that there is a, an RDS encoder built into the transmitter, but we also give you the capability of using an external encoder for RDS or SCA if you so choose. The advanced user interface is not just a graphical user interface, it's a whole control system philosophy because it goes into such depth and allows you to see so many things going on within the transmitter. It allows you to do more with less. It's, it's simple for younger engineers to understand built-in instrumentation. You can avoid trips because you can figure out potentially what's wrong with the transmitter and what to carry with you before you head to the transmitter site. And engineers always appreciate the opportunity to have a little bit more sleep. And it also saves money because all of this test equipment is bundled in, in at the same time that you buy the transmitter, which is oftentimes very competitive with what you'd pay for a transmitter that doesn't have all this functionality. So putting the AUI to the work, it, it, it avoids trips, helps you fix problems, enables proactive Nautel support. Imagine that if you connect up your transmitter to the Internet and you give our customer service department at Nautel the IP address of your transmitter as well as the passwords that you've configured for your transmitter, it allows us to log in, look over your shoulder, and help you to diagnose the transmitter. It also allows us to come in and do a remote install, that is to help you optimize the performance of that transmitter from a distance. And it also allows us to help you with HD configuration. Um, let's just for a moment switch over and look at a transmitter which is operating as we speak in our test room downstairs. So this is a I believe a three and a half kilowatt transmitter, which is currently operating at 90.5 megahertz, and it is um, uh, running at 3.3 kilowatts at the moment. 
you can see here a spectral analyzer. We're going to bring that up and make it a little larger for everybody to see. So this is a true instrumentation grade spectrum analyzer, which is operating at the moment. And you can see that we've got considerable space under the mask here. Um, our typical specification internally here is 3 dB, but this is, this is giving us better than that kind of performance. This is 10 dB per division vertically, and it looks like about 100 kilohertz per division horizontally. So you can see the analog here in the center uh, at 90.5 megahertz, and you can see the two HD side bins, and everything is well within the mask. Now, another thing that I like a lot about this, this uh, spectrum analyzer, it is true instrumentation quality, and I should mention also before I do this part, that it actually has all the markers and everything. So I can, I can take and, and put markers on this and actually see the level and the frequency, and I can check the, the carrier there and, and uh, see what the amplitude of that frequency is. So it's a true spectrum analyzer. If you were to put this in parallel and, and, and bring out a, a, a very expensive $20,000 spectrum analyzer or something, you'd find almost identical results. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to switch the transmitter from looking at the out transmitter output to looking at the audio analyzer. And this is a this is a very interesting feature. I think it takes a couple of seconds here to to uh, begin to work. I believe we'll see if we can make it happen. This is supposed to be a, a composite signal, the composite baseband from zero to a hundred kilohertz, but it doesn't seem to be working real well at the moment. So I must have must have done something wrong, but I'll have to figure that out why that's why it's not doing that the way it's supposed to. And clear averaging. No, it's just not working. What you'd normally see here is the zero to uh, 19 kilohertz uh, audio there, and then you'd see the 19 kilohertz pilot here, and we'll try to uh, get back to that later if we can and, and figure out what's going on with that. Not not working the way I had intended. But uh, the perils of live television, I guess. Um, AM to AM correction. This is showing what the adaptive pre-corrector is doing inside the transmitter. Note that I can take any of these tools and replace them with any other tools that are on here very easily. So I could change to EQ frequency response. This is the transmitter measuring itself and making changes in the DSP of the exciter so as to create the perfect output signal, adaptively pre-correcting for nonlinearities in the transmitter. We also have a constellation view over here, which is showing the QPSK carriers. I can change from various different sets of carriers and to reference carriers like those uh, very quickly and actually go through a lot of the detail here of the, uh, of the performance of the transmitter. Uh, very easily. Lissajou is is typically a uh, a line going from the lower left to the upper right. In this particular case, however, we're feeding this transmitter with composite audio. So that's why we're seeing a rounded circle as opposed to the typical left and right. When you feed it with with composite, we don't see the typical Lissajou display because the composite doesn't demodulate to the left and right. So you can see the other tools that we have at our uh, available to us here so that we can take a look. Now, let's also check out the meters here. There is a tremendous amount of metering which is built into the transmitter. And I can see, for instance, in the controller, I can verify everything that's going on in the controller simultaneously. There's various fans in the reject loads, reflected power. And if you look real carefully, I'm not quite sure how it's going to come out on your screen, but it, if you look real carefully at these as they go, they're being dynamically updated as we watch. So I'm looking at all of the information in the controller on this screen, but I can come over here and look at all the information in the exciter, or I can take a look at all the information in all of the RF modules simultaneously. So in this particular transmitter, this must be a 10 kilowatt transmitter. There are actually four power modules, and um, and you can see here the RPM fans for each one. You can see the IPA bias, the output power of the IPA in every case. Every piece of information is there available. Now, if I click on one of these modules, I can you see the check mark here. I can select which of the readings of, for any of these things, for the controller or the exciter or any of the modules, I can select what I want to put up here 
in the in the screen on the right hand side. So I can have whatever meters I want to choose over there. So that's the metering. Now let's talk about um, the menu. We pull up the menu here and I can look at various presets. And a preset is a very important concept when you're talking about um, HD uh, or any kind of configuration of the transmitter. In this particular case, this transmitter is running 3.3 kilowatts in FM plus HD mode, so low level combined, and its injection level is minus 14. And, and you can see here all of the things that are set up about this particular transmitter. I can look at the bias settings on the modules. I can look at the audio settings, where the audio is coming from. In this particular case, it's composite. And you can see the audio level, the composite level that equals 100% modulation, which is 3.5 volts peak to peak. The preemphasis is not enabled. The low-pass filter is disabled. The audio mode is stereo. We go into the SCA settings. There's a built-in SCA coder inside the NV transmitter. So right now I don't have it enabled, but I could turn on composite SCA, or I could turn on the internal SCA number one. Uh, that's disabled at the moment, but you can see everything is configurable in the SCAs. And the same thing is true with RDS. I can go ahead and configure this transmitter for RDS and set it up for a local RDS generator, and I can also feed the dynamic information directly into the exciter. There's no need to purchase an external SCA or RDS generator because I can send in the data source of the dynamic RDS information, for instance, your artist and title information. I can send that all in um, in real time uh, via either UECP uh, or RDBS or, or external ASCII form any of those modes directly in here. And every aspect of the RDS, including the alternate frequency table, various flags, uh, PYT and PTK, PTY codes, those are all configurable in the transmitter. Under other audio settings, so here's where I can set my pilot level, my uh, one pulse per second sync, which we'll get to why that's important, pilot sync phase, uh, the sample output, audio delay, whether there's an audio delay built in. Note here, these, are, these features are primarily beneficial for N plus 1. I'm sorry, for, for uh, SFN operation. And uh, so this audio delay allows you to adjust the, the delay of the audio in increments down to one microsecond. And in other, in other transmitters, you've got to buy an expensive audio delay unit to get that functionality. In our NV series, it's already there. It's built in. There's an audio loss timeout feature, which allows you to determine what happens if you lose audio, if there's a silent sense in the exciter. Because there's such a broad range of audio inputs in the NV exciter, from composite to left and right analog to AES, EBU, et cetera, you can change a preset and have another preset configured up all exactly the same with a different audio input. So you could have a backup audio path, for instance, coming via uh, a telephone line or, or a second STL or even IP connectivity. Um, and that will allow you to have, in essence, an auto automatic failover in case of audio loss. There's also some very simple audio processing functionality built into the exciter. You can have a hard limiter, an AGC limiter, a two-slope limiter that is configurable and defeatable. So if you, if you do your processing, uh, in the studio, and you send it over a link which is not perfect, not 100% perfect, well, then you can get rid of any uh, overshoots or anything like that in the transmitter should you, should you choose with the, with the limiter. There are literally 60 or 70 or more presets available to you, and then you can adjust the presets either remotely or even with a contact closure, uh, and that functionality is there built into the transmitter. Hardware configuration, this is uh, some of the other configuration that we can do. We can set uh, the transmitter type here. This is an NV7.5, but it has the same number of modules in it as if it was an NV10. Uh, scaling, we can, we can adjust various scaling and thresholds. This is where you've got redundant supplies. All the supplies are there, and they're all functioning. Uh, temperature uh, compensated crystal oscillator calibration value, this allows you to adjust the TCXO, it also allows you to see the frequency of the 10 megahertz input. If you're using a GPS reference for the 10 megahertz at one pulse per second, you can 
check that frequency and then start using that frequency from there. Some very um, uh, technical features for IBOX setting, uh, input calibration is done here, uh, lookup table storage. If you've got an XGen in the transmitter, as we do, the IP configuration of that XGen, um, the IPA bias settings, and you've got some miscellaneous stuff. Should we use the external 10 megahertz? What are our primary and secondary audio inputs? Those types of things are all configured on that screen. We go back to menu. We have the um, transmitter status. We have user accounts here. One of the things that you have the capability of doing is creating various different types of users. Right now, we're logged in as a super user, which gives us the capability of creating new users. So you can create users that are read-only or read-write or super users. So read-write can turn on and off the transmitter, for instance. Read-only can only see the meters. A super user can read and write and turn on and off the transmitter, but it can also create new users. And that's the functionality of that. Um, Let's see here. And we also have over here the ability to do exciter changeover. So we can say, OK, if we lose RF drive from an exciter, we'll change over in, in this case, five seconds. So we can set up auto exciter changeover. And we have software configuration. This is where we can configure up, um, the, for instance, whether we want to reboot the AUI or the active exciter. If we want to change the network setup. So my IP address right there is 10. 03255. Um, I can upgrade the software. I can download from Nautel the software and then upgrade it into the system from this screen. So as we make updates, you get the benefit of those updates. Uh, the watchdog setup, if there's any need to have a watchdog. Screen server saver setup. Email configuration. This transmitter will actually send emails based on notifications that you set up. So a notification is a criteria of something that, that has gone faulty. And then you can configure up any of all of these different um, choices and, and set up a criteria and then set up the email for that. And they can be different emails. So for instance, I can configure up a silent sense uh, a notification email and send it to the program director. And I can set up a another one that has to do with RF level is less than 90% of optimal, and I can send that to the chief engineer. And that's all in the functionality of the transmitter. These are not uh, expensive additional purchases. They're part and parcel of the transmitter. Logging is part and parcel of the transmitter. I can go in and take a look at the logs. I can configure the logs. I can order the logs. I can, uh, can look for just certain kinds of errors in the logs. And I can email these to myself uh, and or download them and save them. Um, I think that's the bulk. Oh, here's where we can configure the remote I.O., the parallel remote I.O. I can set functions to the various uh, inputs and outputs that are available in the AUI. And this allows this transmitter to be extremely functional in configuration with a system controller that you may have at your site. Uh, a site controller system. And, it, and not only that, but the transmitter also supports in, in that light SMTP. Um, it, it does uh, support that uh, very important protocol for the interface of, of uh, site control devices. So that's the, uh, that's the AUI system. Let's switch back and continue on with our uh, walkthrough of the, of the NV series. And uh, hopefully you're seeing that screen now. So the, the, the MV series was designed from the ground up for digital. And I don't mean just HD radio, but also I mean DRM+. Plus. Um, the, uh, the transmitter is capable and has been the main transmitter which has been used around the world for the trials of DRM+, Plus around the world. There's a plug-in X-Gen right in the transmitter as an option so that you can feed the transmitter. It feeds the transmitter with IMQ directly. Uh, we'll talk about HD power boost. We'll talk about asymmetrical sidebands, exporter plus, and reliable HD transport. These are a, t a set of tools that Nautel has developed to make digital radio work, as we talk about in our slogan. We also uh, recognize the needs of broadcasters to improve the performance of their stations in high noise environments and how that may need to be 
uh, raised uh, injection levels for HD radio. So the NOTEL transmitters are fully characterized for operation not only at minus 20, but also at minus 14 and minus 10. Of course, all stations in the United States, I believe, most all the stations, rather than grandfathered, there's some grandfathered ones that aren't, but most all the stations are, are, are allowed to move to minus 14, and, uh, and, and some stations, uh, through a, a technical brief, can prove to the FCC that they can uh, raise to minus 10 without causing adjacent channel interference, and uh, the transmitters also support that. It also supports HD Power Boost, which is a, a, a software tool that we've built into the transmitter as an option, which has two major effects. It, it, it improves the output power capability of the transmitter, the average output power tra capability of the transmitter, as well as the efficiency, and we'll talk about that. We also have built into the new transmitters the capability for asymmetrical sidebands to allow you to be able to set one of the sidebands, for instance, at minus 14 and the other one at minus 10, or what level you would choose. And we're going to talk about the MB series as, a, as a, uh, the ability to create higher power levels in HD than, than anybody's been able, able to do before. Talking about HD Power Boost, it's a Nautel innovation. We've developed it. It applies. Uh, peak to average power reduction techniques, PAPR techniques, to the entire transmitted signal. And it provides more digital power out of the same nameplate or transmitter. So for instance, in a 10 kilowatt transmitter, you know, typically you may be able to get only one number in a transmitter, but if you add HD power boost, you could have up to a 30% improvement. And also, at the same time, substantially higher efficiency in the transmitter, which also equates to much less heat generation in the room. There is upgraded hardware for the NVE exciters. There's an optional software suite which would be implemented in the NVE. The typical return on investment, which is what your manager wants to know about, is less than two years, and it's shipping now. Bear in mind that this is a, a rough indication, but this is a chart indicating the power level that you might get out of the various models of NV transmitter and the various injection levels based on configuration settings up here. So this is without power boost, with a VisBar capability of 1.2 is to 1, HD mode is MP3, uh, and the frequency is 98 kilo, uh, megahertz. And if I were to switch and add HD power boost to this same transmitter, you can see that the numbers across the board get much higher. And so that demonstrates the effectivity of the, uh, of the HD power boost function. Here's a real live view not live. This is something I took off the screen of WAMU near Washington, which is running HD Power Boost today. And you can see that the DCRF efficiency, and they're running at minus 14 in this, in this picture, uh, I believe, yeah, is uh, at 58.3%. So if you look over here, the DCRF efficiency is 58.3%. Let's turn on HD Power Boost. When we do that, that same transmitter at that same power level on that same frequency with the same injection level is running 66.2%. That's not an insubstantial difference in efficiency. That will reduce your power costs, reduce the amount of heat in your transmitter room, reduce your air conditioning requirements if you're cooling your room in that fashion. Let's talk about asymmetrical sidebands for a moment. This was a, an end crazy photograph. We At the NAB, we won a Cool Stuff Award for... Uh, for HD power boost, and we thought it would be really cool if everybody would sit really low on one side and really high on the other. So that was that was uh, HD our, our uh, HD power boost, and we're very proud to have not only the cool stuff but the Radio Inc. Tech Inc. Award for innovation for HD power boost. And this is showing HD power boost on the air at WAMU, and you can clearly see on the spectrum analyzer photograph the minus 14 on one side and the minus 10 on the other there. That went on the air last year. Um, N plus 1. N plus 1 is a technology that allows for another whole level of redundancy in situations where you've got multiple transmitters going into a combiner on different frequencies. So, so in this particular drawing over here, I've got five 10 kilowatt trans transmitters, one, two, three, actually four 10 kilowatt transmitters and one spare. So in this case, N, when we talk about N, is 4. 
plus one. So what happens is this one transmitter, which is this one, I believe, uh, which is the frequency agile one, if any of these four transmitters were to fail, this one would automatically reconfigure itself to the correct frequency, to the correct audio input, power level, RDS settings, SCA settings, everything, and it would then, through switches controlled by the system, automatically plug itself into the right combiner port. So instead of having one plus one, or main alternate configuration for the ultimate reliability, we can take and have four frequencies backed up with a single transmitter. And, and that's a very cost-effective but highly reliable system. Here's the switching arrangements for that same system. So you've got the four main frequencies and the plus one transmitter, and then you've got a controller over here. And that control cabinet, not only the controller there, but this control cabinet would oftentimes have the various audio processors and, and other things for these other uh, these four transmitters and the plus one. This is the switching matrix. So you need the number of switches that you would have for the for the main number of transmitters. So in this case, N was four, so I need four switches. And the way these designs are done is whichever transmitter, if there's no transmitters that's failed, the plus one transmitter, the backup transmitter, actually goes through all of these switches and ends up in the load. If one of these transmitters has failed and this transmitter is on the air instead of that transmitter, the failed transmitter ends up in the load. So you can do service and support on that transmitter. Here's an NV5 installation where N in this particular case was 5. So it's a 5 plus 1 installation. So there are 5 switches above. And here's that uh, NV10 installation where N equals 4. So let me talk about this, the, the, the summary for the NV series. We believe the NV series makes it possible for you to have fewer trips to the transmitter site, reduced engineering effort. You can sit in your desk, monitor a whole range of stations you're responsible for, and, and check every aspect of the transmission capability and that transmitter, what's going on with the built-in instrumentation, unmatched control, no power for, for minus 10 dB or higher injection levels, common modules, it's compact, and now we come to the most important part. Let's see if anybody has put any questions up for us today. And uh, okay, so first question I see here. One second, let me see if I can figure out how to make it easier to to see these questions. Okay, let's see here. Uh, boy, it looks like there's quite a few questions. And it says I've, I've Joe has asked. I've not heard anything regarding fold back for ice, etc. Can the transmitter fold back, and if so, how far? Absolutely. The transmitter will protect itself under every condition. Uh, you can provide a full short to it, you can provide an open to it, or anything in between, and the transmitter will continue. Uh, the typical spec is past 1.5 is to 1 for full power, and then it will continue to fold back, and I think when you get around 3 to 1, it will shut itself off. I believe that is, I, I believe that is accurate. Thank you, Joe, for that question. Um, the, the question here is, a uh, gentleman has said, my perception about the exciter, maybe because of the way it's integrated into the transmitter, would make it, me think it's not robust or, and more importantly, great sounding. Can you tell us the specs on the exciter? Okay. Um, the specs on the exciter, uh, please check them on the website. Uh, talk to somebody, you know, with 614 in the field. Uh, there are uh, many, many people, uh, probably in your city, that have an NV series already. The specs on the Exciter are second to none in the industry. There is nobody that has better audio performance in the Exciter um, than, than the NV Exciter. It's mounted the way that it is um, and, and doesn't have a fancy panel on it because, because the AUI is doing everything to, to control it and to monitor its performance. But we're very proud of the audio performance of this Exciter and would be very pleased to, to put it up against any exciter in the market. Um, let me see more questions here. Um, are there provisions for add-on items, exporter, et cetera, to be added to the cabinet via slot or are those external? The, the exporter and the importer would be external, objects, external devices. Um, the XGEM card does fit directly into the exciter. Joe, thank you for that question. Um, Joe also asks, um, 
what is adaptive pre-correction? Adaptive pre-correction means taking a sample at the output of the transmitter, bringing it back as RF to a, to a port on the back of the exciter, using an A to D converter, very high speed, and then putting it into uh, uh, digital signal processing to analyze it and compare it with the ideal mathematical signal that the transmitter should be creating, and then to create an error term and to then feed that back into the exciter uh, out of phase. So in other words, you cancel the error term and thus maximize the performance of the transmitter. And it's doing that all of the time. So you know, sometimes an amplifier will act a little bit differently when it's cold versus when it's hot or what have you. This transmitter automatically is taking care of that by adaptively pre-correcting for any nonlinearities. And uh, let's see, there's a question about uh, using a higher voltage. Um, you can order the transmitter for a Y connection as opposed to a delta connection. So that's, that's right in Clay. Thank you for that, for that question. Um, any NAB announcements? How about show specials? Thanks, Joe. Um, there are going to be some very exciting things we're going to be talking about at NAB, and I would ask everybody to stop by. I'm not in a position at the moment to, uh, to disclose all of that, but I think you know, we haven't disappointed anybody in the last few years with regard to exciting new things coming. Um, and there certainly are, when I mean, you consider the way the transmitter is designed and the kind of capabilities that we've built it, put into it, there are lots of things that people are thinking about uh, here that, uh, that uh, I think are going to blow people's minds in the future. It says, uh, you mentioned to being able to email logs. I've taken screenshots and emailed them to Nautel support. Those, of course, are not so easy to read. Can you show how to email a log? Yeah, I know it's supposed to be possible. I, I would recommend uh, talking to customer service. I believe that the capability is in there to email those logs, um, but I'll have to check on that, and I appreciate that question as well. So we've come to the end of the typical 45 minutes that we like to hold these things to. I, I thank everybody for your questions. You do have the capability of sending questions uh, after this webinar, either through the interface you've got here or directly as an email to us at um, ckelly at nautel.com, c-k-e-l-l-y at nautel.com. There's more information, more ways of finding out information. The Nautel Waves newsletter, you can sign up if you're not already there. You can see this webinar plus all the ones we've done in the past um, are online. This webinar will be online within a day or so um, in an archive format. So you can download it and then watch it at your leisure. Uh, we have a number of, of wonderful videos up at the Nautel Limited uh, YouTube site. And all of the parts and, and, and even some of the transmitters are available on our web store at store.nautel.com. Meanwhile, I'd like to thank you for being a part of our webinar today. More information is available at www.nautel.com or sales at nautel.com. And our, uh, each of our individual sales representatives um, are ready and, and, and available to, to answer your questions as well. So for now, thank you very much for joining.